This is where did the road go. Our aim is to explore the fringe, to be true skeptics and question openly, to investigate the paranormal, bring light to the dark corners of history, and give a voice to the shunned of science. We deal in mystery and the important questions that these subjects bring to light. What is reality? Who are we? And why are we here? Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com for a full show archive, links to all our social media, upcoming schedule, and much, much more. Now, join your host Soraya on this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? Greetings. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And uh, tonight we're going to be talking with Keith McCloskey. And uh, let's get right into that. Keith, you there? Yep, I'm here, Soraya. Nice to talk to you again. And uh, you were up very early in the morning for us. Uh, yep. <laughs> the opinions <laughs> expressed by the host and guests. pitch black outside still. And where, where are you? Uh, I'm uh, just west of London in a t- little town called Hungerford. Mm. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this book, The Lighthouse, is this your second book or? Well, no, it, it's uh, my fifth book, but it's my second book on mysteries, if you like. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. What were the other three about? Uh, well, aviation history, but I don't think that'll appear, appeal to your uh, listeners too much. <laughs> All right. It's, it, it, it's a passion of mine as well. Okay. All right. We had you on. Uh, for your book on the Jet Love Pass back uh, about a year and some months ago. Yep. And uh, that's been a very hotly debated interview. As people, Some people are absolutely sure they know what happened. And maybe we'll get to a little of that later on. Sure, yep. And uh, this book, however, the mystery, I don't know how to say, I, I, I might know how to say this, but I'm going to let you give us the subtitle. Yeah, it is The Mystery of the Elon Moore Lighthouse Keepers. Mm, I would have had it close. Yeah, Elon Moore is how it's pronounced in Scotland. Okay, and this is, uh, when did this come out, beginning of the year? Uh, well, a bit a bit, bit uh, before that. Um, it's been out getting on for, it's about nine months now. Okay, all right. Yeah. And this is about three lighthouse keepers who went missing at the end of 1900. That's correct. And this little island they went missing from is as remote as you can get, really, isn't it? It, it, it's probably the most remote part of the British Isles. It's uh, there, There's an outer ring of islands up in the northwest of Scotland, the Outer Hebrides, and it's actually 20 miles beyond that out into the North Atlantic. The next stop is Newfoundland. Wow. Okay. And it's not a very big place. No, it, it's a, a small group of seven islands, and um, they're... they're they're, they're very difficult to get to, um, mainly because the weather's nearly always bad there and there's no beaches. Uh, it's all steep cliffs, all of them, including the largest island, which, which is Elon Moor. And it's about, uh, it's, it's probably a few hundred yards long by a few hundred yards wide. It's, it's pretty small, but it rises nearly uh, 300 feet out of the sea. And ha- have people lived there prior to this lighthouse being there? No, uh, the only uh, the, the 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 only habitation, if you like, of the uh, the ma- the main island uh, was in the seventh century uh, when there was an Irish monk had um, built a small chapel there, which it still stands today. Actually, it's huh. a small chapel built of stones, but it's tiny. And he, uh, the Saint Flan, used to go on religious retreats there. It's an island that's really steeped in a lot of um, mysticism in pre-Christian times, which we'll come on to in one of the theories. Yes, yes. Yeah. All right. So now I, I think it's important to set the, the, the tone here as to what life was like then, because we're, I mean, it's only 115 years ago, but it, it might as well be a completely different world. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, apart from anything else, uh, 
the um, when the lighthouse was built in the, the couple of years leading up to 1900, uh, when the men, three men disappeared, it uh, had only been in operation for a year, but they'd still been finishing off the building work right up to the October of the year that they disappeared. They disappeared in December. Um, so, but, but it's uh, lighthouses there in Scotland. They're no longer uh, occupied by lighthouse keepers. Uh, there's no habitation uh, on that island or any of the other lighthouses. Uh, but the, this one was automated in 1971. But it's uh, as different uh, a life as you can imagine from a work point of view. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, even technology-wise, there's. Uh... I mean, that was a world where there weren't cell phones, there weren't uh, airplanes, there weren't, uh, you know, the, these instant communication around the world. When these guys were isolated, they, they were more isolated. You, you compare it to being like in space, but even with astronauts in space, we have instant communication with them. These people had communication with nobody. Absolutely. Well, that, that's the thing about it is that they're... The um, once they were out there and once the ship left, there was no communication at all. Uh, the the, the uh, islands, as I say, were 20 miles away from the coast, so you, you could barely see them. Um, it, so they literally, they might as well have been on the moon without any communication. That, that, well, once that they they were believed to have disappeared on the 15th of December, and it wasn't until the ship, the relief vessel, went back on the. 26th of December, 11 days later, that anybody found out they were missing. So they've been gone for uh, 11 days. And uh, there, there were three of them, and that was pretty standard at the time. Yes, it, it was, yeah. Most uh, of the larger lighthouses had three men. Uh, they would take it in turns in shifts to keep the light working, and uh, the other ones would take you know to get their sleep and rest what and then they could take over so that there was a continual so somebody would always be available obviously the light was turned on in at night time but there was work to do during the day as well but somebody would always be resting and or sleeping uh, whilst the others were working so it was a fairly continual rotation and and it seems tedious especially by today's standards i think well, uh, I've had a lot of help uh, from um, former lighthouse keepers in Scotland with this book. One in particular uh, gave me a great deal of help and explained to me what the life of a lighthouseman was like. I've also had help from, there's only two keepers left alive of people who had worked on Elon Moore. Mm. And I've, I've been in touch with both of them, and uh, one of them gave me pictures for my book that he took when took when he was working on there. And the other one also, as I say, he, he gave me a lot of help about what the daily life was like. But it was, yeah, you had to be a special type of character to be able to lead that kind of life because you, you were three men cooped up together day in, day out. There was, you couldn't go home. There was no home to go to. That was your home. So you had to knuckle down and try and get on with the other two. And uh, that wasn't easy at times, apparently. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, I mean, the lighthouse was such an important thing at that time. The, um, this, this particular lighthouse was built by the uh, Stevenson family. They built a lot of the lighthouses in Scotland, you know, the, you probably heard of Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, the, the novelist. Uh, he's from that family. But uh, this was a prestige project, and there was um, a lot of uh, publicity, if you like, was given to it when it was opened. And the superintendent of the Northern Lighthouse Board, uh, it was his, if you like, his particular pet project, and um, he handpicked the men to work there and, it was a devastating blow to him when they disappeared. He was the last man to see them, three of them alive. He'd just been out there with his wife uh, ten days before they disappeared. And it was, uh, it was a major uh, incident at the time. It was a big shock when the three of them disappeared. All the, all the more because uh, nobody really knows what happened to them. 
Right, right. And uh, but what I, what I was also saying, like the 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 idea of the lighthouse is f- so much more important then than it is now. Not that they're necessarily not important now, but with with the computer technology and stuff, we have a pretty good idea where we are even without lighthouses. Whereas back then, they were very important in in darker areas or when the weather wasn't so great to be able to figure out how close they were and uh, where they were. Yeah, the, 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 it was absolutely critical, uh, especially uh, Elon Moore, because uh, I, I, I call it Elon Moore because that's the main island, but it's commonly referred to the group of islands as the Flannan Isles, the Flannan Islands, uh, after that uh, the Irish monk saying Flan, but they're more commonly referred to as the Flannan Islands, but um, there had been no lighthouse there, and they're quite dangerous uh, rocks. I mean, they're, they're really rocky outcrops sticking out of the water and uh, quite dangerous to shipping, so it needed something to warn shipping uh, of, of the, the approaching rocks when they were in the vicinity. Um, uh, so, you know, it was a prime candidate, if you like, to have a lighthouse built on it. But on in those days... Uh, it, it was, um, it was, as I say, very important to, you know, you didn't have satellite and you didn't have radar then, um, right. so they, they, they relied heavily on these uh, lighthouses. And that particular uh, lighthouse, um, the first person, if you like, or the, the first people to be aware that there was no light working was a ship that was sailing from Philadelphia. It passed on the midnight of the 15th of December going into the 16th of December. It came within five miles of the uh, of the group of islands, and the captain couldn't see the light, and he found it very unusual. They couldn't make out the islands, but they weren't bo- bothered about that because within five miles, the light had a range of 20 miles, and uh, the when the people on watch just couldn't understand why they couldn't see it. Um, so they resolved when they got back to, they were heading from Philadelphia to Leith, uh, which is the port for Edinburgh, that they would report the fact that the light wasn't working. But, and again, I'll come to this in a minute about a possible curse. That ship hit a rock and almost sank within before it even got to the port it was heading to. But mm. uh, th- th- this was about another uh, less than 48 hours further on, on the other side of Scotland. And I'd also say, and I'll mention it again, that ship disappeared without trace 12 years later outside, just off the coast of America. Huh. All right. Yeah. Um, the, uh, wasn't there another lighthouse, too, that, that was supposed to watch for that light coming on? No, there, 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 are, there are other lighthouses in the vicinity. There was uh, um, somebody was paid by the... The, the body that ran it was called the NLB, the Northern Lighthouse Board. They paid a gamekeeper on the main island of Lewis, which was 20 miles away, to keep an eye out uh, to make sure that there was no problems with the light. But the trouble is, because they're so far out and because of atmospheric conditions, he would go many di- days where he wouldn't see the light, uh, but he would put it down to the fact that it was bad weather or the atmosphere wasn't right. So it was not unusual not to see the light for him, but he hadn't seen it since the uh, 7th of December, and he was getting a bit worried. Uh, he'd asked his sons to join him on the headland that's nearest to the islands to keep a watch for the light. So there were there was concern starting to grow when they didn't see it. And you do a good job in the book in the first few chapters of just kind of uh... – giving a feel for what life on a lighthouse was like. And uh, you tell a lot of different, uh, it seemed very personal stories from some of these people. Where did you collect those from? Well, from, from the men that uh, you, they work there. I've been, like I said, I've been one of the, when I was doing my research, I thought, well, you can't write a book like this without speaking to the men who were there. And um, the, the lighthouse board were very, very helpful. They, uh, they put me in touch with several people. Uh, one, of the, one of the men who who I know, uh, who, strange story, I've known him for quite a few years, but I had no idea <clears throat> that he used to be a lighthouse keeper. I'd always thought he'd worked in the aviation industry, but he'd left, <clears throat> excuse me, and started working in the aviation industry, and I couldn't believe it when somebody else told me that he used to be a lighthouse keeper. <laughs> he didn't work on that particular lighthouse, but he knew of it, 
and he always uh, he was telling me that it was never a very popular posting either. People didn't really want to go out there. Yeah, it's understandable. I mean, such a yeah. small little rocky outpost in the middle of yeah. nowhere. I mean, well, it, it, it had a bad reputation as well, you know, after these men disappeared. There, there, there's been other, uh, you know, there's been other happenings at lighthouses, not just in Scotland, but around the world, you know, uh, people have dis uh, disappeared. But this this was the first time that three men, had dis uh, you know, the whole complement, if you like, of the, the, the station, had the whole three of them had gone. Um, there's been other occurrences there there was a murder which i mentioned in my book in uh, a, a lighthouse in in wales where there was two keepers one murdered the other um and there, there's another one sorry that was in scotland as well actually not wales but there, there was uh, another murder in a lighthouse in australia mm. and um you know so yeah. you know people would disappear or die in strange circumstances if you like so it's not unusual, but this was unusual because it was everybody had just gone and nobody knew how or why. Yeah, and you definitely have some interesting stories in there when you're talking about the, the murders and stuff. Uh, do you want to set the scene for what happened when they finally did come to this, to the island with their release? Yeah, yeah sure. The, um, well, well, as I say, uh, people were getting worried um, on the mainland, uh, well, on the main island, that they hadn't seen the light. And uh, the the light the, the he was a gamekeeper and uh, he was on the verge of actually sending a telegram to the Northern Lighthouse Board to say that you know he hadn't seen the light for many days. But what happened was there, there was a relief ship going out with with another keeper to relieve one of the men on the island, and that had been delayed by a couple of days because of very bad weather. It's it's a terrible place in the winter. It's just constant storms up there uh, and really bad storms as well so the the um the the relief vessel came up to the main island uh, there was a station on the main island where the, the families of these men lived and where the men would come ashore for their break if you like they picked the other um the relief keeper up and they made their way out it's it's not a long journey it just takes a few hours for these older vessels to get out there and um, they went out, and when they got to the island, uh, there used to be uh, a flag would be raised to show that they were expecting it, and the keepers would be down on one of the two landings there, because, like I say, there was no beach. You just couldn't pitch up in your boat and climb out of your boat. You had <clears throat> to be winched on. They had harnesses to lift the men on, because the water's always very, very choppy there. Uh, they couldn't see anything. They fired a rocket. <clears throat> um, and this went on for probably a good 30 minutes to three quarters of an hour. So they decided to lower a boat and try and land somebody, even though there wasn't anybody to receive them. So the uh, it was actually the relief keeper that went ashore. He was the first man. So he went up uh, the landing and... Um, he got to the lighthouse and found that the door was closed, but it was unlocked. And he went in, and everything was literally as if somebody just tidied up. Nothing was out of place, nothing knocked over or anything untoward. The beds were all made, and uh, he ran back down because it was quite obvious something had happened and uh, informed the men in the boat to come up, help him to have another look. And then they went back to the relief vessel and um, the, the captain of the vessel put some men ashore to start the light, get the light working for that night. And he then sent a telegram back to the uh, main head office to say that a kind of terrible accident had happened as all three men had disappeared. But the, the, the point about it is that there was no clue as to what had happened to them. Two, the, uh, the two of the men had their outdoor gear on, um, but the third one, his outdoor coat was still on its hook in, in the lighthouse itself. One of the rules for three men on a, a lighthouse station is that one man must always stay inside. And obviously this third man, his gear was on, his, on the, the, the hook, so he was presumably in his shirt sleeves. So to all appearances, it looked as if two men had gone out 
but the third had stayed inside. Except there was no one there. Uh, yeah, precisely. Nobody there. Now there there yeah. are some there are some stories of like a half eaten meal and an overturned <clears throat> chair and such. But you've discovered that was more fiction. Well, uh, that, that's uh, there's been a couple of uh, there, there was a guy called Vincent Gaddis who had written a book and um, he he had uh, if you like uh, enlarged the story up a bit about, about strange entries in the logbook, um, you know, saying that. The, there was a terrible storm. The men were weeping and they were praying, but uh, I, I, you know I, 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 that, that's fictional. The, the overturned chair, the uneaten meal, come from a poem that was made uh, that was written about the disaster in 1912 by Wilfred uh, Wilson Gibson. He was a, a First World War poet, but he just just before the war he'd written this poem, and that's where that comes from. Um, when the superintendent arrived to make a thorough search of the island and launch his investigation into what had happened, he had, uh, uh, you know, he had made the point that all the pots and pans were clean and the men had actually had their midday meal, but there was nothing out of place at all. Which, to me, in some ways, is even more unusual. It's it's as if the, the men had just disappeared off the face of the earth and tidied up everything before they left. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> That's exactly what I was thinking. It's, yeah, it's creepier yeah. that everything's exactly the way it should be rather than some yeah. s s uh, sign of distress. Yeah, because in some ways, I, I think, you know, if you left an uneaten meal, knocked the chair over, that suggests that, you know, that there'd that, been something that happened. That right. They rushed out and maybe were swept over the cliff. But the fact that there was nothing out of place at all obviously they didn't rush anywhere or there didn't seem to be any kind of a rush as nothing was you know the the door was closed and you know the the everything seemed just what you what you'd call normal now the the official log from the lighthouse no longer exists correct well <clears throat> that is correct but uh, that, that when i've talked to the lighthouse keepers about this uh uh, they say it, it, the, the, the logbook was sacrosanct, a sacrosanct record, uh, highly unusual that it would disappear. It, it, the, the, the logbook was there uh, when, when the, um, the superintendent went to make his uh, investigation. <clears throat> but we believe what happened is that he took it with him. <clears throat> he... he uh, he, he had to write up his report after his investigation, and he probably would have taken a blank logbook with him, left that there for that to continue at the station, and taken the, the, the logbook with him back to Edinburgh to write up his report. But where it's gone after that, nobody knows, because I've been to the archives in Edinburgh. It's not there. There's a lot of correspondence there about the disaster, um, you know, and, and even records that the the men themselves had written leading up to the disaster, but there's, the logbook isn't there. It's it's very very strange that that should disappear, though. Yeah, yeah. The uh, and that that would pro possibly answer some other questions. All we have to go on is the reports that were turned in uh, that reference the logbook there. Absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, there, there was. We have a li little inkling of what uh, what was going on because um, in those days, you didn't write the logbook up immediately. You wrote on a, a slate with a piece of chalk. And when Joseph Moore, who was the first man in there, went in, he he looked at the slate and um, he noticed that uh, that had been written up to about lunchtime. Um, just before lunchtime, it, it, it put the weather in, uh, and the, well, what was happening that morning was there was uh, the weather was getting worse, and it was building up to just below storm force, and it was um, it had been written on the slate to be put into the logbook, so we we know, but it, but there was nothing apart from that. It just said there was blustery showers, uh, gave an indication that the sea was building up, and that that's so we know something of that morning had been written by them. But again, nothing untoward. It was just like, if you like, a weather report. Right, right. Now, there are a handful of theories of what happened to these men. There's obviously no proof one way or the other because we never found the bodies. 
Um, and there's just not enough evidence to say for sure what happened, but there are some things that seem a little more likely than others. Do you want to go over some of these, maybe starting with the giant wave theory, since that seems to be the accepted one by the uh, Lighthouse Board? Yeah. Uh, for, uh, one thing I will say, firstly, about the whole thing, um, Soraya, is that the police weren't involved in this, uh, or anybody else for that matter. I mean, could you imagine something like that happening today? Yes. Um, whether it's in the USA or in, in Europe or anywhere, the three men would just disappear and they would leave it to somebody within that organization to investigate it and produce a report. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very, very strange. Um, but, but what what happened anyway, the, um, the, the, the man who made the report was called Robert Muirhead. And he was, if you like, he oversaw the daily operation of each lighthouse. This was his pet project. He'd handpicked the men, and he was the last to see them alive. So, uh, if you like, he was asked to investigate the whole thing. He had an intimate knowledge of the um, the workings of the station because he'd worked the previous summer with them to get it up and running. Um, but uh, his conclusion um, at the end of it was that it was a giant wave had uh, swept the men away. Um, uh, and one of the reasons why he, he put that conclusion um, is, uh, I mean, he, even without looking at anything, you think three men, lighthouse, lots of big waves, obviously it's a wave. You, I mean, you, you feel like the layman would, would arrive at that conclusion without even seeing the place or anything. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not quite as cut, cut and dried as that. But the, the, the reason he, he based it on the giant wave was there was two landings there where you could get onto the, um, onto the island. Um, the, the east landing and the west landing. When he got there, the west landing had been hit by an absolutely massive wave and um, railings had been torn from the concrete, uh, pulled out of the concrete. Uh, a life jacket had been ripped from the railings and taken away by the force of the wave and uh, a large box of ropes which took two men to lift uh, was found broken and all the ropes had been scattered all over the uh, the rocks and the thing about that box of ropes is it was 90 feet above sea level so for a ray a wave to have got up to that would have had to have been bigger than that right. probably uh, uh, so it would have been a wave of 100 plus uh, 100 plus feet and um he, he based it on that now you you would think uh, obviously to see damage like that because it must have been a, an absolutely massive wave to have hit and any men standing there wouldn't have stood a chance there was a, a crane there as well and part of the theory is that they were down at the crane but um it, well, whether it was a rogue wave or whatever um you know, the one thing I've learned from all the lighthouse keepers that I've spoken to is when the weather's bad, which it obviously was that day, is you lock all the doors and you stay in. You don't go out. Right. But the fact that the two of them had their outdoor gear on implies that they were out, but the third man wasn't. But the, the uh, one thing I've, I've done on the investigating on this is I've looked at the records, the weather records, which... Nobody had really done. I went to the uh, meteorological office, and um, you know we had a look at the records uh, for 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 that air, you know for the islands there at that time, and uh, we found an interesting thing um, because uh, I was involved in a. If I can just digress here a little bit, there's a, I was involved in um, uh, making a, a film about uh, not a film but a documentary about this for the Discovery Channel. Oh. On their yeah, on their unexplained files, it's actually still showing. And um, we were we met uh, the a meteorologist at the university, the Highlands and Islands University up in Stornoway on the main island, and he did a, a computerized model of the weather using those old weather records. And the islands were hit by uh, a, a, a really bad storm, uh, almost hurricane force centered directly over the islands um, but it was two days after the men disappeared uh, after the men disappeared so all that damage was caused after they disappeared huh 
Okay. Yeah, which is, uh, you know, uh, make, makes it, makes you think about the whole theory again of a giant wave. Uh, the, the, there was a giant wave, but it wasn't when they were there. And and after that near hurricane, there was another violent storm which caused uh, a disaster further up in some islands, uh, up in the Shetland Islands, where um, so the number of men lost their lives in fishing boats. So there was much worse weather after they disappeared. All right. Okay. Yeah. So that's obviously stuff you came across after you wrote the book. Yeah. Uh, well, it was while I was in. The, well, I, I found the weather records while I was doing the book, and that's in the book. But um, I, I was actually involved in the documentary for the unexplained files just before the book came out, and I added a little bit in about that fact that the worst of the weather was after they disappeared. Um, but they, they, uh, the, the if anybody wanted. What catches it? It's on uh, the their second series of the unexplained files. We went out to the island and uh, filmed that there. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Um. So, so what, uh, what does yeah, that sorry, say? Yeah. What does yeah, that sorry, say? Sorry, I was just going to say, uh, just going back to the giant wave. So, uh, it, it's not quite as clear cut as it seems. For everybody to say it's obviously a giant wave. That's contradicted by the weather reports. It was a bad weather that day, but nothing to have caused the damage that was caused. But even Muirhead in his report says he, he you know, that it, he noticed the damage to that landing, but and it may have happened in a storm afterwards, so he does admit that much. Now, that doesn't explain to people, though, why the third guy was out there. Well, it, no, um, there's another theory about that. By uh, a, a, There was a, a keeper who was based out there in the 1950s, Walter Alderbert, uh, well, he would have been one of three, but he was obsessed with the story. And uh, he was out there for five years, and um, he he spent a lot of time thinking about it and taking photographs of the, some of the waves that would hit the island. And um, he came up with a theory that the two two of the men had gone down to the West Landing, which is where you know all the damage was, uh, attending to the crane. And one of them had got swept away and the second one had run back up to the lighthouse to get the third one to say there's a man in the water come and help me and that would explain possibly why he would run out in his shirt sleeves but I've, I've been there and uh, to you'd need to be pretty fit apart, apart from anything else if you were on the crane platform which is 75, to, 75 feet above sea level it would take you a good long run because it's quite steep to get back up to the lighthouse and it's a good couple of hundred yards so you're not going to do it in two or three minutes it's it's it would take you i estimate probably a good 15 minutes at least wow. to run back up there and then another 15 to run back down probably maybe a little shorter um but it's it's so but you're asked to believe though with walter alderberg's theory that a big wave came along took one of them away and then a big another big wave came along and took the other two away it's it's possible but i say implausible and and that would also imply that he would think that running up to the lighthouse was the better option than trying to rescue him himself knowing Abs that it was going to take him a half an hour to get there and back absolutely yep yep absolutely because yeah you, 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 i mean my my impulse uh, the, would be to get a rope yeah. And, and just do it yourself, you know, if he's in the water, if the weather's bad and all the rest of it, you're losing precious time. Apart from anything else, they, they were wearing sea boots with, and um, oil skins, quite heavy gear. They'd have had their coats on because it was the middle of winter. There's a good chance, I would have thought, you'd have been dragged straight to the bottom if you'd have gone in. Yeah, well, yeah, there's that too. Yeah. Huh. All right. And then you, you go on to, in the book too, you also illustrate a... a the whole phenomena of freak waves and such that just arise out of nowhere um, and the the whole giant wave thing, which is different from a tsunami, significantly. Yes, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the thing is, it, <clears throat> I'm not saying there aren't freak waves there. There are. There, there's some gigantic waves up there. Uh, well, one of the biggest waves ever recorded was by a ship that was only a few miles away from there, uh, well, I say a few miles, a bit more than that, but in the area, there was a 90-foot wave officially recorded out there. 
uh, not that long ago. Um, uh, uh, they're really big waves. And what when we were talking to this meteorologist when we were doing the uh, Discovery Channel program, he was telling me that the way these waves build up is they start building up down near Portugal because the prevailing winds tend to be coming from the southwest. And you, the, 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 the way a wave builds up, you call it the fetch. And what's happening is a wave is forming and it's building up and building up and building up. And there's nothing to block its path. So they're building up and then they're coming up and then they're hitting the northwest of Scotland. And they've been building up for the best part of 800 to 1,000 miles. So wow. by, by the time it gets to those islands, you, you've got really massive waves approaching. Um, not all the time, obviously, when the weather's bad, but, you, you know, uh, you, you can see how you can get these huge waves building up. And, and it does get hit by them. And, um, and there's, it's a very stormy place. It's bad weather nearly all the time out there. Uh, I mean, the, there's an expression. Uh, they, they say December is all about storms in the Flannans. And um, it, it's, you know, if you don't like bad weather, it's a god-awful place to be. So... Uh, <laughs> No, nobody, nobody's saying that there, is, there aren't giant waves there. There are. But you see, all the more reason, uh, lighthouse men, especially the, the principal lighthouse keeper there, uh, James Duckett, he, he, was, uh, he, he had 20 years' experience. And when you talk to these lighthouse men, they're not, they're not straight out of school. They know what the weather's like, and you don't put yourself in harm's way. That's why they always say, if the weather's bad, you lock all the doors, you bolt everything down, and you stay inside. Huh. All right. Now, one of the other theories that people throw around is that maybe there was foul play involved. And it would have had been among <laughs> those three because there was no one else on the island. No one else could get to the island without their assistance. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, that's uh, something that was focused on in the documentary uh, that, that, that was done on the Discovery Channel as well. Um, uh, one, of, one of the three men, when we looked into it... Uh, it turns out that one of the three men uh, had a, a bit of a reputation as being um, uh, what you'd call a hothead. <coughs> Excuse me. There was there was two keepers, lighthouse keepers there, who were employed by uh, the Northern Lighthouse Board itself. They were proper official lighthouse keepers. The third man, um, Donald MacArthur, was what was he was a relief lighthouse keeper. Um, and although he was employed by the board, he lived on the main island and his services were only called upon when he was needed um, in the event that there was sickness. And one of the, the normal complement of the three men had, had been taken ill and he was actually um, ashore uh, at the time. So he had been replaced by this third man, Donald MacArthur, but he had a reputation as a... Uh, uh, it were, you know, if you like hearsay, that he was a drinker, um, a bit of a hothead, uh, and, and not a person to, how should we say, take a lot of nonsense lightly. And he'd been out there, when we looked at the records, or when I looked at the records, he'd been out there for uh, the best part of two whole months. And he had a croft, which he ran on the main island, you know, like a little small holding with his family. And I suspect that uh, he was probably getting fed up a bit because you'd, you, you'd do a stint of six weeks out there, but he'd already been out there with only a very short break for the best part of two months. And he was well into December, still out there with no end in sight. And it could have been that he was getting really fed up with it. And um, one of the theories, the theory that I put forward in my book, or one of the theories is that he had an altercation with the principal lighthouse keeper and attacked him uh, or uh, it could be and the situation i put forward is that the two men went out with their weather gear he'd said to macarthur james duckett had said to donald macarthur i want you to come down to the uh, crane with me to have a look um macarthur had said given his temperament well you can do it i'm not going and uh, he so the third man who is uh, a bit of a gentle giant, he went instead. And we think that MacArthur may have been fuming over the exchange and that this had been building up for quite a period of time. And he went out after them and caught up with them by the steps and possibly a fight broke out and the three of them went over. 
uh, with the third man trying to intervene because apparently he was a bit of a brawler, this bloke. Now, it could be that uh, you might think, oh, well, the three of them going over, highly unlikely, but I've been out there, and the steps that go down to that landing on the crane, uh, even a gust of wind would take you right over the edge to go straight down nearly 200 feet. It's a, it's a hell of a hike, and there's nothing to stop you, and the steps are very, very steep, and if you lose your balance, you'd go, you, you wouldn't be able to stop yourself going. They're quite dangerous. Huh. All right. But, yeah, so that's, uh, I mean, if there was any theory where there'd been foul play, there was no sign of it in the actual lighthouse itself. So if something happened, it would have happened outside. Right, right. Um, and, of course, there's the supernatural element that a lot of people will uh, lean towards, and there's a lot of uh, history in those island chains of, of different things as well in the in the folklore sense. Yeah, there is. I mean, uh, you can't. I, I don't think you can necessarily dismiss those theories that easily because um, there's a lot of bad luck associated with that place. Um, I mean, just before I get into that, in pre-Christian times, uh, it's believed that bodies were taken out to that island and uh, they were buried there and burnt on funeral pyres. Um, and uh, the, the, there was a man named Martin Martin who chronicle the history of uh, those islands up there in uh, he had a book published in 1703 and what he found when he was talking to people up there is that, that the local people uh, and some say even to this day they're very superstitious people um, and it's considered that, that they were always considered to be uh, almost holy islands you know the sanctified place you know with the, the burials of the dead out there and um you know, the theory is that the sanctity, by building this lighthouse out there, the sanctity of the dead had been disturbed, and that that's why the men disappeared with no explanation for it. Um, I, I don't know if the, you remember, there was a film out, it was redone with Nicolas Cage, uh, called The Wicker Man. Yes. Um, uh, that was set, that, that, that was, the, the whole point of that film was, you know, an island where, you know, it was... Uh, pagan festivals were reenacted and in in the original film which was made in 1973 the policeman investigated investigating it gets burnt alive at the end by the islanders it's so the, you know the, there's a lot of it based uh, a lot of part of that film was based on the the sort of happenings up there you know in pre-christian times and but, I, and, and i would yeah. recommend that if anyone's going to watch it they watch the original not the remake yeah, the remake I didn't think was that good. Um, no. but, the, the, but the original had a real spooky... I know it's an old film now, 1973, but it had quite a, a spooky sense about it. Yes, you know, yes, the, it the, the, the With the policeman trying to find out what's going on and everybody knowing something that they're not telling him. And you can almost sense the doom coming uh, in the film. It was quite well done. Yes. But uh, when, when they, they used to take sheep out there as well and graze them out there, and they used to... In Martin Martin's time, who wrote the history book, he, he, he spoke to people who would go shooting fowl out there. But when they went out to it, it was, uh, they, would, they had rituals. They would say prayers uh, whilst moving around the stone chapel out there. They would say prayers where they would go around the chapel three times, and uh, it was treated as a very holy place. They would approach the, the once they got onto the island. They would approach the chapel on their knees. So the, the, there's a very mystical sense about it, and there's, there's um, pre-Christian burial markers on, on the main island as well. I mean, to, to go up there, you get a real sense of it, you know. Um, and and it's it's felt that the sanctity of the dead had been disturbed, and that that's why, without explanation, the three men just disappeared. Um, but there's also, I'd like to go on to, a lot of bad luck associated with the place. I mean, obviously, you could say there's bad luck with three men disappearing, but you've got that ship that passed that night, the Arch Tor, mm -hmm. and that hit, that hit a rock uh, before it even got to port after leaving the islands um, the, 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 uh, within 48 hours just before it reached port. It hit a rock and almost sank. That ship then sank with everybody on board without trace. Twelve years later, and one of the uh, the one of the men working on the island died 
out there. Um, there. There was one of the reliefs who came to replace one of the three missing men. He fell from the light tower and was killed within uh, a very short space of time of arriving out there. And one of the, the man who was meant to have been there on the day the three men disappeared, uh, Donald MacArthur had replaced him as a relief. Uh, he dropped dead um, on his next posting in the lighthouse. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of, uh, what's the word? You know, people could say, well, it's all just coincidence, which, of course, it could be. But uh, there's also a lot of bad luck attached to it rather, yeah. than, good, good, rather than good luck. <laughs> um, now, what about the legends of little people on the islands? Well, yeah, the, 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 again, the, the, the little people, there's, there's, there's uh, supposedly a race of um, pygmies that lived up there. Again, you're going back to um, when Christianity was coming into the islands, there was, a, there was a race of small men living up there called Lost Bird, and they, they, they were pygmies. Uh, they were, I gather... Uh, not particularly pleasant people. Um, they're, they're, there's been various sites excavated where they found bones of, I mean, some of these bones have been examined and people are saying, well, the, this is, you know, or small animals or whatever. But <coughs> never, nevertheless, they, 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 there are stories about these pygmies, but the, one of the earliest Christian saints up there was uh, hanged by them. Um, so they, they, they weren't known to be fair, very pleasant people. And again, it, it comes back to this sense of mysticness, if you like. Um, and well, I wouldn't quite say spirituality in their case, but it, 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 it's not a it's it's not a good thing. You know, the, the whole sense of the place seems to be disturb. Don't disturb this place because bad things will happen to you. That That's the the overall feeling you get from it. Okay, and th there's also uh, some theories that they had maybe uh, ingested some ergo-contaminated bread as well. Again, that's possible because when you get um, uh, when when in those days when when they were relieved, you you got your rations for you know the next six weeks basically, and and it could be longer because with bad weather up there, you could be out there for two months, three months at a time. So whatever food you got had to last you because there was no running water out there, you know, um, that you could catch rainwater, obviously, but there was nowhere to grow food. Some, uh, in later years, some of the lighthousemen were telling me that, you know, you could catch lobsters, and you could catch fish, but they basically had to rely on the food they got and the bread they got, you know, if it was rye bread, if it was contaminated in any way, uh, with ergot, uh, then you know it would make it, it could affect you quite badly. It would imply that all three of them would have had to have eaten it, but it makes you behave in very strange ways. So it's it's a theory, you know, and and why not when you think in in place of the fact uh, that there's nothing else that's been proven to me. It has as much validity as anything else. The three of them could have been hallucinating, just walked out. Two of them put their stuff on third one didn't and just walked over the cliff or were washed away, walked down towards where the, the, the waves were and just disappeared. I, I would think the thing that argues against it is that two of them put their, their winter gear on to go outside, which says they were thinking somewhat rationally. Mm. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we can't prove anything, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's the thing with a lot of these mysteries, though, you know. Um I always keep an open mind on everything you've got to. I, to be honest, in, in, in this particular case, I don't think it's ever going to be solved because it, it's uh, 115 years ago now. And, yeah, um, yeah. you know, it, it's not like, uh, you, you know, uh, the two people had seen the logbook, so there's nothing untoward in that. So everybody, obviously, who was alive then is dead now. There's nobody left alive, say, unlike... Uh, say the Dyatlov mystery where there, there are still people alive who may know what happened but right. in this case there's not there's absolutely nothing so you all you're left with is just conjecture and you know putting forward your own theories there's nothing to back them up i mean you never know you so uh, they say they search the island thoroughly 
maybe they might find three skeletons there, but you know, would they would they still be in any condition to be found? Because when I went out there, we landed on the west landing, and it's quite dangerous to get up there, which shows you the power of the waves. They've the um, in 115 years, uh, sorry, not a, not even 150 years, uh, 15. Um, it was automated in 1971. So in what's that now? Uh, 30, 40 odd years, 45 years. It's um, the waves have washed away the steps which were built oh, wow. into the place. So we had to use ropes to get ourselves up. Um, you know, you put them into some metal spikes that were sticking out of the ground, uh, out of the rocks to get ourselves up there. And it's quite slippery. So it's, not, it's but it shows you that the waves have, you know, literally eaten all the concrete or smashed the concrete away. So even if there had been skeletons there of the men that you may have found, I'd imagine there's probably nothing left of them either. Right, right. All right. Well, before we move on to uh, some updates on the Outlaw Pass, the book is The Lighthouse, The Mystery of the... Elon Moore. Elon Moore. Elon Moore, Lighthouse Keepers. All right. And you are, of course, Keith McCloskey. Yep. And this is out on history books, isn't it? Uh, history Press. History Press. Okay. Yep. So uh, your other book, which is on the same book company, is on the Dyatlov Pass incident, and that was entitled uh, Mountain of the Dead. Yep. And, and you said there's been some, some new updates to some of that material. Yeah. The, um, where the There was somebody who went up to the pass recently. They they took um, – it's still in the process of being looked at. Uh, it's um, – uh, they, they, it's somebody with a bit of money, obviously, because they took a helicopter to get up there. But they, they were um, uh, took a, a metal detectors with them, a party, and they've been mm. scouring the whole area. I mean, there've been other people up there with metal detectors, but uh, they found the the remains of a crashed military aircraft up there, huh. um, which is interesting. But uh, the, the the initial findings are that it may be from a later period, but it's. Uh, it's an interesting development, and there's been uh, some new theories put forward. Uh, one I quite like, um, I have to say, and um, I'll give full credit where credit is due. Uh, a guy uh, who I correspond with regularly called Steve Smith from Chattanooga. I'll say hi, Steve, if he listens to this. Um, he, he came out with an interesting theory that uh, there was a lot of illegal mining going on in the Ural Mountains. Um, I mean, there is mining in the Ural Mountains uh, of gold, uh, amongst other uh, types of mining. But uh, gold mining always attracts uh, people for obvious reasons. Right. And um, the, he, he, his view is that there had, might have been illegal mining going on, and that uh, <coughs> that is something in Soviet times that would have been pu punishable by the death sentence because it was an economic crime. So anybody who was prospecting for gold um, and shouldn't have been, who, who had been discovered, would probably take great pains to ensure that uh, anybody who'd seen them wouldn't live to tell the tale. So I, I quite like that theory, and I've uh, just tried to contact um, uh, a Soviet expert, uh, sorry, uh, he's a, a Russian expert on Soviet times and mining to give me his view on that. But uh, it's it's uh, quite an interesting development because nobody's put that that theory forward before. Yeah. Um. I yeah. The, the, I'm hoping to get up there in August. Uh, oh. To go up with uh, Yuri Kuntsevich from uh, the Dyatlov Foundation. Uh, I'm, ho I'm 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 hoping to interview some people up there. Uh, how shall we say within the authorities? But uh, it's difficult getting people to talk. But um, I'm I'm hopeful on it. So uh, we shall see what what happens, and I'll I'll keep you I'll keep you posted on it. I I would think that the the one obstacle to almost every theory is the condition the bodies were found in. Because if it was illegal mining, why not just dispose of them? Absolutely, yeah. But you see, uh, I suppose uh, you could say the ground was hard. Um, yeah. You know, you can't dig so easily. But my uh, gold prospecting is done in, in water, so. You know, you'd have had to break ice to do that anyway. Um, but you see, uh, I, I, well, I, I must admit, I'm toying with the idea of a, com a new book and going completely into my theory on it, which discounts a lot of the official versions. You know, the, this business of, you know, eyes missing. I mean, you can see there's eyes missing from the 
photographs, but the tongue missing and all the rest of it. Uh, it makes me wonder whether the, um, the the guy who performed the autopsies wasn't told what to do. You know, it, it's almost if somebody said to him, look, when you do these autopsies, you make it look as if some of them had died of this, some of them had died of something else, so you'll never really get to the bottom of it. And that's why I included the bit about the anthrax in my book, because uh, the authorities were you know, basically would change any autopsy to suit the story they wanted. So, mm. you know, I, I'm not even sure that you can go by and all the autopsies that were released. Mm. When, when you look at the radioactivity as well that was supposedly in the clothes uh, of some of them, they, they didn't even specify. They, 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 were, they talked in loose terms of jumpers and bloomers, etc. you know, that, that had traces of radio. They didn't even specify this was on this body or this this body that was found here. It was all done in a very general sort of sense. And and the radioactivity was connected. Um, they, they'd taken, uh, they compared the samples, the tissue samples, with people who'd been involved in um, car accidents, you know, or in, in accident, died through an accident in the city itself, in Sverdlovsk. So they, to, to compare them, I can understand that, but everything seemed to be mixed up. It's almost as if people, you know, that there they was being done to, to fuzz the issue. Mm. You, you, you could never get your teeth into anything. You couldn't say, well, this is this is Luda's body. She had this amount of radiation in her body and all the rest of it. But, uh, I mean, you could probably get to the bottom of that now because radiation lasts for a long time and you could probably exhume the bodies and carry mm. out further further tests. Um, but apparently they, they won't allow that. Huh. Okay. So, uh, you know, but it, it, like I say, the, I wanted to go into it and start pulling it apart. Uh, there's, a, there's a guy I, I want to meet when I'm over there who I gather is uh, not easy to talk to, but uh, I I'm, I'm may put out feelers to see if he'll see me while I'm there. He was the, the first guy to start pulling the whole thing apart. Um, and I, I think that's what it needs. Uh, I think too many people look at it and take at face value what's been said. And, and it's only when you start to do that that, um, you know, you, things start making a bit more sense. There, there's a good quote by, uh, I don't know if anybody reads, uh, and my Spanish is not particularly good, so excuse me for mispronouncing <laughs> his name, but Jorge, Jorge Luis Borga, or Borgia, uh, the, the novelist, uh, he said, he may, uh, I can't remember the actual saying, but he, he talks about mysteries, but he said mysteries are sort of all fine and well, but he said when you start digging, you'll find things, most things are sl slight of hand or slate of hand, <laughs> which I, I think there's, it's, it's a pretty good saying. Yeah, well, there's, there's definitely some genuine mysteries out there, but yeah, I mean, sometimes people want to mystify things that don't need to be mystified. Well, let me let me give you another example, Soraya. In in um, it's in the book, and and they discovered it just before the book went to press, and so I had to rewrite it very quickly, and I didn't do it. I don't think I did a great job on it, but um, you, you know there was a, a plane disappeared. It took off from uh, I think it was uh, Severalsk Airport with a local police chief on board. Basically, what had happened? They'd all had a lot to drink. Uh, there was a party of, I can't remember how many now, nearly a dozen people climbed into an old Antonov too, uh, all pissed out of their heads. Uh, and I don't mean, sorry, you don't want swearing on here. Uh, but but uh, we use the expression piss not to be angry. In, in, right, that's no, uh, fine. Here. But we mean uh, very drunk. But they were all, they'd all had too much to drink, climbed on board the plane to continue the party, God knows where, in a, a clapped out old aircraft. The plane took off and it was never seen again. Um, so there was all sorts of theories that this was... You know, I actually had some of the papers sent to me that were printed in Russia at the time. Um, you know, they brought up the Dyatlov theory. They said, this plane's disappeared. Is this anything to do with the mysterious orbs uh, that, that took the Dyatlov people and all right, the rest right. of it? And just before the book went to press, the plane crashed just a couple of miles away in a swamp. So uh, the pilot was obviously too drunk to maintain control and went straight into the swamp. All the bodies were found. So... You know, a mystery is only a mystery till you, you get the answer. And the answer, <laughs> sadly, is usually very mundane. 
Yes, yes. Well, there are, uh, a lot of people like to compare the Diatla Pass incident to the work David Politis is doing. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. I am, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think what he's he's finding it counts as a mystery for the moment, at least, until we know what's going on. Um, but it, I, there's not really a connection between what he's looking at and the Outlaw Pass, even though a lot of people want to, you know, make that connection. The the criteria he uses are completely different. Then none of them are present in the Diablo Pass scenario. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm familiar with his work, and and um, the the thing about uh, Diablo is uh, it it is strange. There's no doubt about the Diablo story. It's very very strange. You know, you, you, if it was just say one person, you know, you think okay, or even two or three, but the, we're talking about nine people, all very fit, and you know. Uh, intelligent people they weren't stupid they 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 knew what they were doing they knew where they were going and yet they all end up wind up dead in very very strange circumstances so even if there's a if you like a rational explanation it still doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense you know it's yeah. and uh, and I want to say also sir I that I I I keep a, I do despite what I've just said there I keep a very open mind on the on on the at love uh, I I think you've got to I, I think if you say this is my theory, and I'm not going to listen to any other theory. I, I think you're closing a lot of uh, avenues for yourself to investigate it. You know, I know people have their pet theories. Um, this this guy who went up there and uh, found the military aircraft, um, uh, you know, the crash site, uh, his theory is that it's uh, a, a missile had killed them, you know, a missile blast, which, right. you know, and... and his view of that final picture where you see the lights coming down, um, you know, his view is that that's different stages of the missile breaking up. It's possible, but, you know, that it's not backed up by the dates of launches. But it, it, to me, he's closing it all off. You know, he's explaining part of it, but he's not explaining all of it. Right. You know, um, <clears throat> and okay, the authorities may have cleared it up, but... Uh, uh, it could be a com as people say, it could be a combination of theories or whatever. But you know, it, I, I I don't close off anything. I don't. I mean, people have contacted me. If you look on my Diatlov website, I was uh, contacted by someone in California who's a medium, and they've they had a, a session using the photographs, and the, they they put uh, the de I put the details on my website from that medium. Now, a lot of people would throw their hands up in horror and say, oh, you know, <laughs> fancy believing in this. But I, I, my mind is open. I don't necessarily go along with what was said or whatever, but, you know, it's uh, it's just another theory. Right, and, and, right. and by using another theory, somebody may arrive, you know, at a different route to the right answer, you know. And I, like I say, I, I say to everybody that I discuss it with, if you can think of any other angle on it, let me know, you know, and let's discuss it. Right, right. And the uh, and the thing is that, that what I liked about both your books and what I like about talking to you is that you're very grounded about it, but you're also you're an open minded skeptic. Well, yeah, that's a probably well, yeah, it's a good way to describe me, I think, because uh, one thing I, I don't discount discount is the light odds. There, there may be something very unusual happen there, and I have to say, there's a part of me. You know, you, when I was a bit younger, you know, but I'd say, oh, you know, don't talk to me about that rubbish or whatever. But <laughs> uh, there's a few things that have happened to me in my life where I have become a lot more open-minded about possibilities. You know, uh, the, the the UFO theory, uh, I know people will lump UFO theorists into a group and say, you know, label, give them a label, uh, you know, a not very nice label or whatever. But, you know, uh, again, it can it can be disproved. Right, that, that's the right. whole point about it. And, uh, you know, people have been slated for the Yuri Yakimov theory. I mean, I, I do believe he did see something, and uh, something that was inexplicable, and it was backed up by a forest ranger with the strange lights. Uh, I, I, so, uh, I, I believe him. I believe he saw something. What it was, none of us know. He doesn't know. The forest ranger doesn't know. Right. I mean, right. the forest ranger is a guy who uh, said this in the... The other interview I had with you, you know, he's a guy who's lived in the forests all his life, you know, not easily scared, but, you know, whatever it was that happened frightened him. Right, right. And the, uh, and the thing with UFOs, I mean, if you if you look at the lighthouse thing, they have the tales of little people being there. And people like Jacques Vallée have shown the, the connection between 
UFO encounters and little people encounters back in those days as well. So, yeah. Whereas I, I don't necessarily believe that's what happened to them. I mean, there there could be a possible connection there. You never know. Well, no, but, but the, the the fact that it's it's the you see the 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 thing between the lighthouse and the atlog is whatever happened. Nobody nobody has actually been able to give a rational explanation for any of them. You know, I know you can say a big way, but. To me, if you'll pardon the pun, it doesn't really wash because, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, it's too simplistic in my in my view. And I know people say, well, the simplest answer. And I, I do say you can use the, the principle of Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is usually the right one. But I don't believe it is in this case, you know. And every, every lighthouse keeper I've spoken to has said to me they just wouldn't have been down on that west landing. They may have put their outdoor gear on to check something else that was happening outside at the immediate area of the lighthouse station because the the, the wind was very high you know there there, there was loose uh, equipment out there that that's more more than likely why they were out there in their gear but you know the, this theory that you, you you would put yourself in harm's way a man with 20 years experience of you know being in dangerous conditions just wouldn't have put himself in danger or or, or his, his his work co-workers so, you know, uh, I, I, I don't believe that the simple explanation is the right one. And, and you know, you can't explain it. You can't explain the atlog. Nobody can. People can say, I, th this is what happened. But my, uh, my answer to that is, well, prove it beyond doubt. And nobody can. Yeah, the, the Yeti explanation seems to be a favorite of a lot of people. And I think the problem starting right there is we don't even know if the Yeti exists, much less if it had anything to do with this, this incident. Well, I think, uh, you know, again, I, I don't say it's a load of rubbish because uh, I, I was involved again with the Discovery Channel. Uh, they concentrated on the Yeti theory. Um, uh, you know, the thing is, all right, if there is a Yeti, it's obviously a very large, powerful wild animal similar to a bear. Right. So you would expect to see, uh, I mean, you can, the one thing about the analog is, is you can see pictures of the bodies, and I mean, none of them look as if they've been, you know, attacked by a wild. You'd expect bites, you know, limbs torn off, if you like. Right, uh, right. And um, presumably, yetis have to eat, so you'd expect there, <laughs> uh, you know, you'd you'd expect, um, you know, that the, the, there'd be sort of signs of having, uh, of them having been eaten by a wild animal, but there was none of that. You you can't see any of that in the photographs, and assuming the autopsy is genuine then you know there was no mention of any bite marks what i, what I would say about the the yeti and um it only occurred to me the other day is it, it seems to be a creature that although nobody's ever really captured one or seen one it seems to me to be a creature that's similar to the bear and i would have expected yetis to probably hibernate because they're they're similar similar type of creature so you know the bear bears hibernate that's why they, they weren't attacked by a, a bear right um, right you know so you don't expect to see these types of animals out anyway and plus you, you know i think with yetis you, you would expect to see tracks not not just related to the atlob but you'd come across other tracks you know the you know if they are around there's going to be obviously more than one of them and you would expect to see more tracks. I know it's pretty remote up in the northern Urals, but uh, you know it's not that remote. You know, the, 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 there's a couple of two or three uh, tour groups now leading people up there. Uh, the, there's a sort of scenic stones beyond um, where the Diatlov passes. So the, there's people up there all the time. There's people going up there in winter now. You know, I mean, it, it's easier to get to these places with. More, you know, you can use uh, snow, uh, not just skiing, but snowmobiles. Right, so, you, right. uh, and people just don't come across these tracks, or you know, uh, any any other sightings of them. Hmm. <clears throat> All right. Now, what what are you working on next? Is this going to be more well, of like the love? Like, well, uh, yeah. Uh, there's two. Uh, you know, I'd like to. I'd like to put my own view forward on the Atlov uh, because I don't. I haven't really done that yet. But to do that, I need to speak to people. I need to, to uh, speak to people in Russia. You know, interview them, 
you know, that's not going to be easy. But I've got several people I want to interview for a new book and uh, and go into the theory myself, make a little do a bit more research on the military, what they were doing up there. Um, but also, there's a, a new book I want to write about the disappearance of two girls in Rome in uh, 1983. I won't say too much about it, but there was uh, two girls disappeared within um, six weeks of each other in the, in the center of Rome. Uh, and there's all sorts of theories about it. They were linked to, if you can believe it, sex parties at the Vatican, um, <laughs> Italian gangsters. But they're, they're strange, very strange disappearances. And uh, it's a big, big case. Uh, it was a big, the, the both disappearances were quite big at the time. And I mean, and they still have a lot of interest in Italy, but uh, I, I became quite intrigued by it. The, the fact that two girls just disappeared in broad daylight in the center of Rome. Um, uh, they've never been seen since. Oh, all right. So, so I'm hoping to uh, make a start on that very shortly. So would that likely be your next one then? Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. I'll be. I'm hoping to get over there. Fair again. The thing is, with anything like this, I think you've got to go there, see the place. You know, see where they disappeared. Talk to their family if they'll talk to me, and talk to people who are involved. So you know, do do properly research it. I don't believe in doing things sitting in your armchair. I like to go to the place. It's like um, the, just going back to the Flannans. <clears throat> you can't get an idea of what the place is like. I mean, there's been plenty of armchair theorists on it, but you've actually got to go there. Um, if, you, if you go to my website, uh, my author's website, not the Diatlov one, which is uh, www.keithmcclosky.com, if you go on to my uh, Lighthouse book, if you scroll down, I've taken a number of pictures while I was out there, uh, which shows you what it was like, you know, the, the, the spot where the men were believed to have disappeared from by by the superintendent, I actually stood on that very spot. But you you can't get a sense of what it's like till you actually go there, you know. Um, and and you get we we were coming back on the boat in in the early evening. The sun was setting behind the islands, and you really get a sense of the loneliness of it. You know, you can't describe the feeling, and you can't do that by looking, uh, you know, the pictures on the internet. You you've got to go there and and feel it if you like. All right. Okay. And uh, the Yatlov uh, website is what? Um, it's uh, Mountain of the Dead. Uh, if you, I'll tell you what, sir. I, if you wouldn't mind, could I send you the links? Yes, I will put the links yeah. on the in the archive yeah. entry with the with the yeah. interview. Yeah, it's uh, Mountain of the Dead is the dot uh, com www dot. I think there's a dash in the middle of it, but uh, I'll send you the links if you, if you'd be so kind as to Absolutely. put it up. But, but uh, all the new theories, and there's a few new theories coming through. Um, I put them on the Diatlov page. Again, if you just scroll down, you can see the theories. If anybody wants to contact me and like to discuss the theory, I'll, with their permission, I'll put it up on the website because it gets other people thinking. Um, and and in, another interesting one, which is on my website, which I'm not sure I discussed the last time, um, <coughs> and I won't use any foul words here, but apparently <laughs> the uh, the Mansi used to distill uh, reindeer urine uh, to drink uh, because it gives you hallucinations. Mm. Um, and there's one of the theories put forward is that they drunk some of that and uh -huh. made them behave the way that they did because they were in the Mansi area and they, they you know, they they uh, met Mansi tribesmen. Um, so you know, it's again that's a possibility. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, think that, that that's on the website as well. I, I think that's a pretty decent possibility too. I mean, because once they're in that that altered state, who knows what they're capable of doing? Well, the other the other thing I, I liked about that theory, Soraya, is that uh, you know the, the old Soviet Union in in the late nineteen fifties a pretty dry, doer place, you know, and. Uh, any type of misbehavior was frowned upon by the authorities. So you got a bunch of young people want to let off a bit of steam. Maybe they, you know, they went up there and they're letting their hair down and somebody says, try some of this, you know, it'll make you feel really good. And they probably thought, why not? You know, it's, it's quite plausible. Yeah. You know, yeah, a, a, bit, a bit like going away and, you know, taking a couple of bottles of whiskey, having a party on the beach, you know, you, you let your hair down, you, you think, well, let's try something different and, 
you know, nobody's nobody's watching us, and we're out in the middle of nowhere. So, you know, it's it's quite plausible. Absolutely. All right. Well, I thank you for uh, talking with us tonight, or early morning yep. your time. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll get a couple of hours in still. I think. <laughs> All right. Well, I look forward yep. to your next book. And, yep. Uh, oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll I'll be in touch anyway, sir. I when I mean I, I I've got a bit of work to do, so. You won't hear from me for a little while, but uh, I'll I'll stay in touch. Obviously, any developments um, on the Atlov, I'll, I'll certainly keep you in the picture. Awesome, awesome. Thank you yep. very much. It's a yeah, fascinating story. And both books, again, I highly recommend. They're both well worth reading. Um, the Lighthouse book, it, uh, you do such a great job of putting you in the feel of what that time period was like and what it must have been like to live that life. It's uh, and you, And you definitely explore the whole thing in great detail in this book yeah thank you very much thank you all right we're going to take you out with some psyche corporation this is nightmares thank you keith yeah thank you soraya all the best bye-bye